everyone, quick show announcement before we get started. For our 100th episode, we're going to be interviewing me. If there are any questions you'd like us to ask, email us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or reach out to us on Twitter before next Friday, May 26th. Now, back to the show. Hello, and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we'll be talking to Dr. Stephen Smith about our global dependency on certain maize varieties. Plant breeders know that it's important to have diversity in the global gene pool. But how does one go about measuring the diversity that's present? How do we know if progress is being made? And what obstacles can there be to data gathering? This episode, Stephen walks us through a project designed to look for genetic diversity and the challenges this kind of project can present. We'll talk more about that in a minute, but before we dive in, we want to thank our sponsor for this episode, Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash Earth. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. Today, we have Stephen Smith with us. Stephen got a bachelor's from the University of London in 1974. He earned a master's in genetic conservation in 1975 and a PhD in taxonomy and evolution of maize in 1977, both from the University of Birmingham in UK. His postdoc work was with maize and teosinte evolution and diversity with Major M. Goodman at North Carolina State University in 1977. From 1980 to 2015, he worked at Pioneer Hybrid International in Des Moines, Iowa, working on variety identification, genetic diversity, intellectual property protection, and genetic gain. Since 2017, he's been a professor and lecturer at Iowa State University for agronomy and seed science. Hi, Stephen. How are you doing today? Well, very well, thank you. The sun has come out again in Iowa, as people know who live in the Midwest. We can go from 80 degrees to 37 degrees in three days, which we have done, and we're getting back up towards the 80s again. Yep, that's that's exactly what happened to us this weekend in Wisconsin, not too far away. Well, we are so glad to have you today. So as people might have guessed from your bio, we are going to be talking about maize today and specifically about just uh, the genetic materials that are used in crop breeding with maize. So to get started, can you just tell us a little bit about some of the problems that crop breeders can face related to that issue and specifically some of the background of that in the U.S.? Yes. So um, the genetic base is is what we refer to as the genetic diversity that um, farmers and breeders um, use most of the time. So maize was domesticated uh, originally in Mexico, in Oaxaca, about 8,000 years ago. Uh, it then sp- People then carried it northwards and southwards through the Americas. Maize arrived in the North American continent about 5,000 years ago and was cultivated up in New England around 1,000 AD. Um, and then, of course, maize was much more widely used uh, on the east side of the United States, and that was particularly after there was another introduction very recently in in modern terms in the um, 16, 1700s from um, uh, the Caribbean, quite likely from uh, by Spanish uh, explorers. And the the two different parts of corn came together, the northern flints and the southern dents, to form what was called the corn belt dent. So that was an amalgam mixing of two quite different races of maize to produce what is now the most widely cultivated uh, set of genetic diversity, in not only in the United States, but very widely used in the world, called the corn belt dents. And and it it was quite quite diverse and 
And you need diversity because plant breeders cross um, two parents together and they the genetics recombine and segregate and you're creating new diverse new diverse arrangements of that genetics and you're selecting for plants that perform the best um, and in so doing your selection process actually s starts um, removing some of that diversity you, you're selecting the best so you you're leaving some behind and um if you if unless you bring in some new genetic diversity eventually um you're going to run out now um we don't appear to have run out at the present time but plant breeders are very well aware that um unless they do start introducing some new diversity into the US maize breeding programs that prospect could occur now um one big event that happened with with maize was the southern leaf corn blight in the early 70s and that was a result of most of us corn being in a particular cytoplasm which is not the nuclear genetic part um but it was an example of where if your um genetic or cytoplasmic material is is too narrow and doesn't have all the diversity that you need, and it's particularly vulnerable to um, a disease, the southern leaf corn blight organism, uh, then you're gonna have a bit of a disaster. And that's what happened in the uh, early 1970s when they had the big outbreak of southern leaf corn blight. And um, about 15% of US maize was lost. Uh, and that was valued at about 7.2 billion. Um, that's in current um, terms. So that's, that's inflation adjusted. So um, that event actually led to a big report and study by the National Research Council, which is essentially National, National Academy of Sciences. So they looked at the genetic diversity of major US crops and issued a report in 1972 with some recommendations. And um, we were interested, my co-authors and I, in looking at the extent of usage of the Corn Belt Dents uh, in the United States. And we thought, well, we'll try and see if we can figure out um, just how widely used uh, that set of genetic diversity is in the rest of the world i mean it's uh, this was nothing new though because it was well it's been well known for decades that the corn belt dents are used in other countries but we thought it'd be a good opportunity to see what the trends have been in the last few decades since that report came out and it just then so happened that uh, when i started thinking about how i was going to write the uh, the introduction I suddenly twigged that, by golly, uh, if we got this manuscript ready by about 2022, that just so happened to be 50 years since that report came out. So that was a nice little hook to hang hang the paper on. Yeah, absolutely. So then did the NRC, like what were... I was about to ask, did they have specific recommendations? But of course they did. So yeah. can you tell me a little bit more about what those were and if there was any kind of timeline or, you know, like a hard goal that they were trying to reach? Or was it just kind of, here's some things that you should consider when you're doing plant breeding? How how did that all shake out? Uh, I think it was more general like that. They They understood that breeders create diversity when they cross parents together and let them recombine and segregate. And, and then you've got more mutations may happen, but that's a pretty slow rate. Um, they understood that. They went through the breeding process to explain how breeders do what they do. And, and they understood that selection per se, without adding anything more, ad adding new diversity, will, di will eventually and everyone knows this, uh, reduce the diversity. So um, they were looking, they tried to get some estimates of how much 
diversity there was in, in the US major crops. And of course, um, 50 years ago, this may be uh, news to many young people, um, but there were no molecular markers. So these days, everyone thinks, well, it's quite simple to measure diversity. You just go and send it off to the sequencing lab and come back two days later, and there you go. Um, well, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't like that. For example, um, it was only by the late 70s in maize that there were 20 genes that you could use to look at the genetic diversity of, of, of maize, for example, the um, isozyme systems that were developed at North Carolina State. So the, there were some things you would like to do, which is measure diversity, but those tools weren't available. They talked about being monitoring this, and um, and you can do that to some extent by looking at pedigrees, um, looking at the, and, and which inbred lines are used more than others, and what's their pedigree background, and then is there change in time? And uh, there have been studies reviewing this on a sort of regular basis. They, their primary recommendation, at least for maize, and that's the one I've looked at, really I haven't looked at the others so much, but was there should be a new way of, of considering how you do breeding. And by that, I think they meant you, programs need to be developed so that there is new diversity coming into a breeding program. Now, the challenge that plant breeders face in doing that is that it's awfully easy to add new diversity. I mean, it would be, it's very simple. Uh, you could uh, just go and cross in uh, the wild relative of maize, Teosinti, and have lots of diversity. And if you were a commercial breeder, you'd be bankrupt in three years later, if not sooner, because you have to um, have useful diversity. And uh, the challenge of the, one of the primary challenges of plant breeding has been, is, and always will be to find useful diversity. There's lots of diversity, but you have to find useful diversity. And um, a lot of the um, materials that would add to the diversity of US corn happen to be in the tropics. They're adapted to a completely different environment. Um, if you plant them in Iowa, they may grow to be 20 feet tall um, before they will flower because of day length issues. So there's, there's quite a bit of work required to adapt what we call exotic genetic diversity before you could even begin to test it in the what's called a target environment, say in the Midwest to see if it's any use. And, and then, in fact, it might take several decades to actually um, find, keep finding useful, useful stuff. Um, so that, that was well said by them. And in fact, some prog programs were then developed um, to actually undertake, undertake those activities. Uh, so, for example, um, well, Major Goodman at NC State had a program to um, adapt tropical hybrids to evaluate uh, their utility and bring new germplasm into the United States. And there's, there are several programs. The, the, another well-known one is the Genetic Enhancement of Maize Project up at Iowa State. So those programs um, have been underway. Um, and one of the questions we looked at was, well, what, what um, evidence do we have that new diversity has actually been introduced into the United States in terms of being uh, in varieties that are grown on farmers' fields these days? What, has the situation changed in terms of the genetic diversity from 1972 till now? Yeah. Oh, I love that answer. I'm so glad you mentioned just how the, the diversity is incorporated, because in my mind, I'm like, you know, do you just throw in a random one every, you know, four generations just to spice it up? You know, 
And obviously that is not very practical, as you mentioned. So I love that. Um, thank you for just answering my question before I even had it. Um, but obviously I don't want to rabbit trail too far down that road because we have a lot more to talk about. So mm-hmm. what uh, did you find as far as the major genetic pools uh, that you were looking at for this review? Well, what we found was that there is not a lot of transparency in in getting hold of the data in a public published format that you would need to be able to answer the questions. So, for example, what we did was well, first of all, we we looked at the major the major maize producing countries and um that's obviously united states and china those two countries together produce um nearly about half of global maize um so us is about 27 percent of global production china 19 percent then brazil 6.2 argentina 3 ukraine 2 so uh, that height, as we've all understood in over the last year or so, just how important Ukraine is in global uh, maize and wheat and um, oilseed production. It may not have been very apparent to, to many of us. It wasn't to me until I ended the, the study. And then, and then it tails off to about 2% or 1% for, the, for other countries. So we looked at the main producers and then um, we searched the literature. And in the United States, um, Corn Belt Dent has been augmented a little bit with with some germplasm that's more recently come from, um, for example, Argentina. Um, But we decided, well, that's just by now an inherent part of Corn Belt Dent. So we considered that basically um the US was pretty much still completely reliant on corn belt dent now for the US you we there's some so that each country has its challenges in terms of data as i mentioned what you would really like to do is have a lot of molecular marker data for the um i mean ideally what you would like and, and let's uh, let's face it, molecular marker data or sequence data is a surrogate. I talked about useful diversity. Well, you can compare sequences, but until you can connect those sequences to actually what's going on in the field, to a phenotype, to how a plant works, uh, it doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Sure. Unless you've got some idea what what um, what the sequence might be coding for, what proteins and but I mean, um, to to know what's useful, you have to connect sequences to phenotypic performance. But just looking at diversity, what you would really like would be a lot of molecular marker data on hybrids that are currently grown. And you would like to be able to survey widely grown maize fields, maize hybrids, say every five years. You would like to do that. Now, there are issues. There are many issues that get in the way of doing that. Uh, One is there are legal issues which make that impossible. Um, We don't need to go into more detail unless you want on that one. Secondly, just how are you going to sample everything? Uh, And then how do you know which hybrids are actually used the most widely? Now, there are some surveys that you can sign up for and pay money that at least they used to be. Uh, where you would get that information. Um, the the other and the reason you want molecular marker data, well, one re- another reason is because you can have hybrids with different names, but they may be very similar, if not the same. I mean, you may have the same base with different stacks of um, trans uh, GMOs in there, but you might not necessarily know that it's the same genetic base. So, being able to survey directly the diversity as it is in farmers' fields would be the ideal way, but it's it's challenging and it's it hasn't happened in the US, uh, at least since 1990 when we actually published a paper 
on genetic diversity in the US of widely used maize hybrids because at that time, the legal issues weren't there to prevent someone doing that. And um, that was before the era of GMOs, so it wasn't so complicated as having many different versions of the same thing. Um, so you can't do that. So the next thing you can do, though, is um, look at the inbred lines that are being used that have been protected by plant variety protection. And you can actually do molecular profiling on those, but you have to wait until they come off protection. So then your molecular marker data are 20 years late. So it's like looking, uh, looking at your speedometer, um, you know, two hours after, after it, you really do want to look at it in real time and the field gauge, you want to look at it in real time and not uh, only see it two hours late because you might have run out of fuel by then anyway. So, so we used what we could in terms of um, pedigree information and molecular marker data, but for the US at best, it's 20 years old. China, which was the next most a widely um, production, a big biggest production area in the, in the world it is is was refreshingly for once different. Um, the names, the pedigrees of hybrids, generally speaking, were publicly available. So hybrid X, you could find out from published literature from China, uh, which the two inbred parents were for a single cross hybrid, and there were published data of the um, of the SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms of the molecular marker data, those were publicly available from different studies. So for China, we were able to actually go into fairly recently grown hybrids in the early 2000s and use published data to look at how things had changed in, in five-year periods from the 70s so that was that was very that that was very handy now i'm not sure that situation is going to continue but um uh, there may be more secrecy uh, down the road on what the parents are but that that was really the best data set was from china and then other countries um the situation you're lucky if you can find any market data at all and you have just to look for people talking about the, the pedigree backgrounds. So I'm, so that's, those, those are the sort of data we would have liked to have had, but what we found was the, the best situation was, was from China, but, but even there we found it difficult to find which hybrids actually, what extent the relative usage was. But there were two hybrids that really were the most widely used in China, and um, we were able to make some conclusions from those. So, I mean, one of the big problems that we found, one of the issues that we found was there's just really, a, it's difficult, the data are difficult to find. And um, there are many reasons. One is legal issues, as I mentioned. The other is um, companies, and understandably, um, don't want to give all their trade secrets away, or any of them, actually. And so the pedigrees of the hybrids and the amount that they used uh, isn't isn't necessarily available. Um, but we did what we could, and so one big conclusion was that if you want, okay, we we considered it was important to try and monitor trends, um, but the ability to do it uh, isn't necessarily there. Sure, sure. A bit of a gap. Yeah. Yeah. So for this gap, I mean, is there any, and maybe this is another one of those things that's just impossible to tell, but is there a way to tell, like, maybe we're working on it and it just hasn't like made the jump into use in the field, or is it just like too much of a black box to even know? I mean, obviously, like every plant breeder we've ever had on the show is hyper aware of the issue of needing that diversity. So it's not like 
nobody's thinking about it. So, I mean, is there, did you find anything that was like an optimistic thing or is it just like we can't tell and need to like build up our systems in order to get there? Well, well, as you said, plant breeders know full well that this is an important issue and they know that unless they're able to bring in some new and it has to be useful and as I've said, that's the challenge, diversity, they won't, they don't have a long-term program. Um, plant breeders, um, they, they have to balance the short-term with the long term. If they aren't successful in the short term, they're gonna there is no long term. But if they're only thinking short term, then there is no long term. So it's it's a balance that has to be kept. And I think the challenge these days is when you have breeding organizations with um the top management being more of a background from business and accountancy or law, they need to be very um, good at listening to their plant breeders. And the plant breeders have to do their best to uh, make it clear to the people who provide the funding, and this includes shareholders, that they they obviously have to be successful in the short term, and that's what all the pressure is always on. I mean, when are you going to have a new hybrid? When are you going to get more market share? When are you going to fix that problem with that hybrid? You have to do that. But they also have to be thinking longer term. And um, so the, the, the people at the head of the research have to um, tell upper management the story in a such a way that upper management can understand that there is a long term and a short term. And the focus isn't always on the short term, because another thing we, we found from the review was that several corn companies in the 60s in the US really made some mistakes for various reasons, and they effectively ran out of useful diversity. Um, and um, so there's some lessons there that um, the plant breeders, I hope, they know full well. They they have to help educate the funders, and they have to be, um, and then they have to utilize the new new knowledge that's coming along at a very fast rate, and all these new technologies to to get that balance right, so that they can be effective in the short term, so that they get. Um, they can sell some improved products and get some money in to reinvest. Um, so they, they, they've got to get their research programs such as to the, balance it out the best as possible. And it, I mean, it's uh, uh, all credit to them who can manage that, I would say. I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Stephen's paper, Global Dependence Upon Corn Belt Dent Maze Germplasm, Challenges and Opportunities, published in Crop Science, is always freely available. If you are a certified crop advisor or certified professional soil scientist, you can take a quiz for continuing education units for this episode, which can be found in our show notes or on certifiedcropadvisor.org. Thanks again also to our sponsor, Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Listen to their new podcast, We Measure the World, to hear how innovative researchers leverage environmental data to make our world a better and more sustainable place at metergroup.com slash Earth. Thank you for being our sponsor. Let's get back to the show. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I have a plant breeder on, I feel like we end up having these like philosophical discussions of how do you know the right path to travel and there's just so many nuances in it that have really drawn me to this topic again and again. Um, so it seems like from the data that you were able to get a hold of, uh, we're still 
pretty reliant on on this and some other common types, um, but we're aware and moving forward towards getting that diversity. And I know you, as part of your review, were looking at um, some of that uptake of the NRC recommendations, but also maybe some other recommendations um, that plant breeders should be considering as we hope to move forward in this area. So could you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, the other recommendations were, well, first of all, um, the, ge the Genetic Enhancement to Maze project has made available a lot of new diversity. And um, it's hard to tell if that then has been translated into, um, in, onto U.S. farms. Uh, also, companies have purchased other companies and... Um, now, if you just purchase another company in the United States, you're probably not going to increase the genetic base because it's already in the United States. But there's been some purchases uh, outside. There may have, there may be some new diversity there. Um, we were unable to tell that because we didn't, we weren't able to get molecular marker data, and the pedigree information sort of runs up against a, a, a bit of a buffer. You come up with a name that you have no idea what it means. So we suspect that there has been some introduction of new genetics, but we couldn't prove it. And um, getting back to the plant breeders, they 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 now use sequence data pretty much in maize breeding pretty much on a routine basis. So the maize breeders and many other crops too. They are monitoring, they, they can monitor the diversity, and I'm sure they are, I know they are. I mean, they, they've got the molecular marker data to help them in selecting improved um, uh, inbred lines and hybrids, prediction systems and such. And they've got all these things uh, fingerprinted, as we would say in a very loose terminology. And they, they know where, they know where, for example, on one side of the, the parentage of a hybrid where there's a lack of diversity because they, they, they can see it from the molecular marker data. So they know this and that can help them, I think, plan how they're going to not just randomly bring in a whole load of stuff, which increases diversity, but probably ends up with bankruptcy, bankruptcy <laughs> quickly uh, to help find useful, useful diversity. Um, what we, we also found was that there's an increased use of corn belt dent around the world. And the changes that have happened in the U.S., where there's been um, some of the older inbred lines and corn breeders, people will know these names, and from B73 from Iowa State, B37, Ohio 43, Missouri 17, these are golden oldie lines. Um, there's been a decline in the use of those and there's an increase in usage of something called iodent that was um, developed initially by pioneer over several decades from the 1930s through the 60s 70s um those changes are also you, we could see them happening in china just a few years after here very quickly China is, is updating its genetics, and it's very similar to the genetics from the U.S., um, which is good for their product productivity, but again, it, on a global basis, we're narrowing. So one of the recommendations was that the National Research Council report was for the U.S., but um, this is a global issue, so the world needs to think this through on a global basis, and we're talking about global diversity so um th there are more resources out there now as i mentioned tropical hybrids if you grow them in the u.s uh you know they'll probably frost will come before before the seed matures and you'll need several step ladders to to get up and do pollinations but if, if more more funding of breeding tropical stuff in the tropics uh that app that in effect is doing what we call pre-breeding for other regions. So the more that um, useful germplasm genetic diversity can be found in tropical hybrids in, in the tropics and subtropics, 
that then tells you, well, that, that's potentially useful in in uh, temperate climates and vice versa. So I think it, it, it that there needs to be more funding, um, more support going into trop breeding tropical tropical maize because that that is useful on a global basis. We sure. So that actually moves us pretty smoothly into my next question, which was actually, uh, what are maybe the future recommendations for or future research areas that we could grow in? Um, I know both for like the data and being able to track the diversity, but also just in general <laughs> about resolving this issue. Well, I guess it's not really going to be ever maybe fully resolved, but <laughs> maintaining that diversity in, in the long run, I should say, maybe. Yeah, so I think a future research area is to actually, first of all, use molecular markers to get a much better understanding of the origins of the Corn Belt Dents, particularly the Southern Dent part of that, because it isn't, I don't think it's that clear as to what was brought into the United States in the um, 16, 1700s uh, that we that, that were called the Southern Dents. So their origins uh, and how they track to maize in Central South America, I uh, and then how it sits in the whole global picture, I think would be really an important thing to fathom out. The next thing is to be able to look at all of maize diversity using a common language. So to um, select a set of SNPs or a set, a set of sequence data that would allow this common language so we can look at um, diversity between um, Corn Belt Dent and the tropics and different races, there's sort of two or 300 races of maize to get a much better understanding of, of that to have a global picture. Now, the challenge, one challenge would be to look in, at, to have as much detail that's useful without having so much detail that um, proprietary breeding companies would be frightened to um, have any of that information in the public domain. So it would, um, I think, um, that if researchers and the pub private sector could sit down that with the public sector breeders, I think there are things that could be developed that would be basically useful that wouldn't give any any secrets away. And I think that would be very handy. Um, as I said, more investment and work just breeding in the tropics would, would be really, really good. Um, what's called pre-breeding which, for example, Major Goodman, as I mentioned before, was adapting tropical hybrids so that they could actually uh, evaluate the utility of those genetics in the United States. And that's what the Genetic Enhancement of Maize, the GEM project does up at Iowa State, the USDA project. I think much more of that's needed. And um, then it comes down to the same old thing, and that is, well, it, it, when I was when I started off on this path, doing the molecular stuff, well, there wasn't much of it, but that was the, with twenty loci. Um, that was the expensive part. The laboratory stuff was the expensive part of the thing. Well, that isn't the case anymore. Um, so you could sequence a whole lot more things than than on a regular basis now than was ever even conceivable uh, just a few decades ago. But those um, those sequence data on their own are just entirely useless, really. You've got to connect it to field performance. And, and so it's the phenotyping, which takes all the time and the effort. So to do a lot more uh, connecting of the genetics with the phenotyping, I think, is really crucial. Now, some people, um, I mean, it's, it's very, humans get dazzled with technology. And, um, you know, 30 years ago, we were all dazzled with GMOs and all that was going to really solve everything. And at the, at the moment, everyone's dazzled with um, gene editing. And I think we need to be um, quite careful as to understanding just 
how much gene editing or any any work with with a few relatively few single genes can do um you know someone might say well what we don't need all this diversity i mean it's just you we can mutate things and we can edit everything we want um well i i think uh, that would be it's putting all your eggs in one basket i mean it, you're making a huge bet and when you don't need to and i think that would be stupid and there are many characteristics, most of the important agronomic characteristics that, um, are controlled by many genes of individually small effect. And to whether or not we'll ever be able to uh, identify some of those, I think is a question. And so that this is where pre-breeding comes in. So all, lots of molecular marker work, phenotyping, uh, gene editing, great. Uh, but let's also not forget that what we call pre-breeding, which is the beginning of adapting a tropical material, for example, to the temperate environment, and then some breeding cycles using those materials. I mean, it, it's taken 70 years to still get new stuff out of Corn Belt then. So you, you, the breeders, you know, you, they're not going to be able to find everything in the next three years. It takes time to um, recombine the genetics and and sift through this stuff. Um, so I think um, the, the pre-breeding, where we're actually just trying to tease out and look for useful materials, um, that, that that that's that's an important part that just has to keep going on. Now uh, to to get the stock market analysts really excited about something like that is tough because you know you want to show them all this all the new latest whiz bang technology and um get the i would the, the trick is to get them all excited so you you get funding and, and then let the plant readers figure out where they're going to best invest those resources into what they're doing yeah, I think those are just some great uh, places to go. I'm a huge fan of using all the tools in the toolkit, so I like that approach. Um, I did just want to mention, because uh, I know the term has come up a few times before, and I forgot to mention it earlier, um, phenotyping is like the more physical side, the traits you can see uh, with your senses, as opposed to like the genetics of things, just so anyone who's unfamiliar with that term. Um, so I have three questions left for you. So the first one is where can listeners learn more about this topic? Okay. Um, there are several places. One good place to go is Simit, C-I-M-M-Y-T. That uh, is the Maize and Wheat Improvement Center in Mexico, part of what's called the CGIAR system. Norman Borlaug, um, We'll, we'll talk about wheat for two seconds here. The, the wheat breeder who was born in Iowa, he did lots of work for the Green Revolution. He was working out of Summit a lot of the time. Summit have a, a really good program um, with maize where they are, in fact, combining molecular marker data with a lot of phenotyping to connect the genetics with then how the plant looks and operates in the in the field. That They have a lot of good information. The USDA... Um, North Regional Planetary Introduction Station in Ames um, is is a really good place to go to. The um, the National uh, Plant Germplasm System NPGS is a really good place to go on the USDA website. Another really good place to go to is the Crop Trust. Um, www.croptrust.org. Uh, that's an endowment fund set up to um, provide money to support genetic conservation in gene banks. And they are, they, they're concerned a lot about diversity of genetic resources. Um, so there's just a few, few useful places to, to go to. Yeah, for sure. We'll include links to all those in the show notes. Good. Um, so then the second question is, if listeners want to get involved with any of this, what can they do? Yeah, well, um, everyone eats food, and um, I eat too much, by the way, and have done for a long time, and it's difficult not to for me, but I try somewhat. 
Um, and it's really wonderful that everyone now is thinking about the environment. And even in Iowa, where you know we're surrounded with cornfields and soybean fields, many of the people here do not understand what's actually going on, that farmers actually um, plant new seeds, new varieties, and the breeders uh, at the various breeding companies here in Iowa State uh, are developing uh, improved varieties. They, they don't know any of that. And so I think it's really crucial to um, make the public, whenever you've got the opportunity, in a chatting to someone in the grocery store, uh, or a, do a session at the local library or something, uh, just make people aware of where food comes from and what it takes to develop new varieties. And the, in, the, the improved varieties of maize today actually make much more effective use of the water and the sunlight and the um, fertilizers than the older varieties. So they are actually sort of green, <laughs> no pun intended, they're green technology. And um, to to actually make people make this help people make the connection that agriculture, how agriculture is done, is a crucial part of sustainable living uh, in terms of making more effective use of genetic resources. Um, rather than just piling on more and more and more fertilizer and having half of it washed down the rivers. Uh, so, and I think you're starting at a real early age to um, have, have try and in, in have a culture where right from the earliest age, people understand that the environment's crucial and that how we use it to produce to produce food crops is is critical part of the whole picture. And I think every, everyone everyone can help, you know, make that point. And the trick then is to tell the story in such a way that the audience you are actually in front of, whoever they may be, I mean, they may be university professors, they may be ten year olds, or whoever can can understand what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, great advice. Love that. Yeah, and talk to and and uh, try and help politicians and policymakers understand this is really important too. Yeah, yeah. Everyone's gotta. Everyone's gotta know. It's important yeah. stuff. Yeah. So then, I have one question left for you, which is: What is one fun fact that listeners would not know about you if all they had was your research? Well. Uh... There are several things, but the one thing I will tell you, and everyone listening, is that um, I try uh, and play a pipe organ. A, a, oh, like, wow. As you might find in a church or in a big hall. Um, so here you're using both hands and both feet to, to play this instrument. And I've actually got... Uh, a four manual, that's four keyboards, organ console in my house with a full pedal board. And it's connected to a computer. And the computer has in it recorded 15 different cathedral organs. All right, now you don't play them all at once, but you can select one, for example, Hereford Cathedral in England. And up pops on the screen as if you were in Hereford Cathedral, the the stop list, the things you pull out, mm -hmm. bring on a few pipes. And I've got some quite large loudspeakers in the house. And so you can, and if you shut your eyes, you would think you were in Hereford Cathedral, England. Wow. Oh my gosh, listeners, you can't tell, but I just had like the biggest smile on my face the whole time he was yeah. talking. That's amazing. Yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. Wow. So I, I played in a student recital with several other students. I'm I'm the oldest of them all, by the way. You might really gather that. 
uh, at Upper Ames uh, last Saturday afternoon, and then next Saturday I'm playing another two pieces uh, <gasps> at, at, a, at another church in Ames, which uh, after we finish here on the podcast, I'm going to go and do a bit of practicing. So if oh you gosh. open your windows uh, and it's loud enough, you might hear me. <laughs> That's amazing. Oh, I love that. What a what a delightful fact. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, well, yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for that and all of the other fun research-related facts that you shared today. I learned a lot. So thank you so much for your time and for being on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you all and thank you everyone for listening. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Student Spotlight, where we highlight the work of graduate and undergraduate society student members. Today, we'll be talking to Yajwant. Welcome to the show. Can you start us off by introducing yourself and where you're studying? Uh, my name is Yashwant Kumar Pankaj. You can call me Yashwant, and currently I'm working as a graduate student research, and I'm pursuing my PhD at Department of Soil and Crop Sciences at Texas A&M University, and my major is plant breeding. Wonderful. And what are you currently researching? Um, I'm working on peanut breeding, basically, and peanut breeding are genomics to enhance the oil content of peanut and also developing the new breed for peanut, which could be used as a biodiesel nuts. Yeah. Sure. And if you could have your dream research project, what would that be? Oh, uh, my dream research project would be, uh, so in future, I, I would like to work in a, maybe a USDA or a similar organizations as a crop scientist towards crop improvement, their practices and implement new methods to enhance their production. Awesome. Well, if you'd like to get in touch with Yajwan about his work, we'll have his contact information in our show notes. Thank you so much for being on the show uh, and best wishes on your future studies and career. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. More information can be found in the description below. Thank you. Thank you.